Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Burning Bonanza Lunch and Learn. Um, we are in our second week. Um, this one is going to run all the way through the middle of March. We've got some really great speakers coming out to talk with us about different things that are impacting birds um, in our area and how we can help them. Um, today, um, we have our very own Diane Smith, who's going to be talking about um, nest boxes and how they can be used for different birds, how we need to make sure that they're used properly and set up properly um, to get more birds to, to visit them, um, and how we can get them ready so that you can have them in your yard in time for um, the birds to start coming back and wanting to nest in them. Um, we're really excited about these, these series, um, and I just wanted to make one more plug um, for something else that's coming up, um, and that is our Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, it happens every year um, through National Audubon, um, the weekend of President's Day weekend, so the 12th to the 15th. We will be offering on Thursday evening, the 11th, a virtual sort of introduction of birds we might see and how the count will work. Um, and then people are welcome to do it in their own backyards or if you want to be around a few other people with masks and social distancing, um, we'll also be doing a, um, a in-person walk um, and bird count um, here at uh, um, Honey Hollow on the 13th at two o'clock. So definitely sign up for that um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Diane um, to tell us all about nest boxes. All right. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about a whole variety of different nest boxes. Um, not all birds, of course, are cavity nesters. So I'm not going to be talking about birds that make cup nests or uh, hanging nests or anything like that. This is strictly about um, birds that are cavity nesters. In the, uh, in the past, gosh, it seems like the past couple of years, we've been losing more and more and more trees. So the need for nest boxes is getting greater and greater because as you know, dead and dying trees come down, there's less opportunity for birds to make their own cavities or to find cavities in naturally occurring areas. So um, they're more likely to use a nest box if they're not able to find a naturally formed cavity. So I'm gonna go ahead and start um, sharing my screen. Um, where is my program? All right, this is interesting. Stacy, why is my program not showing up on share screen? Um, is it open? It is open. Hmm. Very bizarre. When it it should show up as one of, as one of your options. If not, if you just share your screen nope. and then just find I got it, it on the screen. Oh, I, there you I, go. I found it. I found it. Excellent. I found it. Even though it was open, it was, I guess I have too many things open on my screen. Oh boy. That can often be a problem. There you go. All right. Slideshow. All right, so this is, as I said before, all about nest boxes for birds that need them. Um, and we're gonna start with something that a lot of people don't often think about in terms of nest boxes. Um, this is an American kestrel. It's our smallest falcon. Um, it's fairly widespread and it needs uh, open areas across you know, kinds of fields and, and other areas, but it does, it's, its habitat is across the entire um, United States. Um, although it doesn't, occur in the high Arctic, but that's about the only place. So they, um, they like to perch on, you know, wires and telephone poles, and they, um, they are insect eaters and small mammals, um, and they do like human modified habitats. So they can be found quite often near um, human activity, and they will even occur in heavily developed urban areas. So placing a nest box for these guys is very, um, is very likely to go ahead and have one come and nest. So here's a picture of one with some of its prey. For those of you that are having uh, mouse problems like I am, you're happy to see raptors with mice because the more we get, the, <laughs> the more they take, the fewer we have in the houses. So this is a, a map of their breeding range. And you can see that um, it is quite extensive, covers both continents um, in this hemisphere. And it is, of course, throughout Pennsylvania. So 
we have um, our breeding range here is from May through August. So the sooner we get a box up, the happier they will be. So this is a plan for a nest box. So you can see it's a fairly large box. The sides are 16 inches. Um, the hole is a fairly large hole. It's a three inch diameter hole and it needs to be placed pretty high. So this is um, not the easiest box to put up um, because it needs to go roughly 15 to 20 feet up. So you need a fairly decent pole with a good footing or a, ni a nice large tree that you can, you can put it on. So you want these up um, by March. Um, that should be about the latest you put them up because that's when they start to establish their territories. You can put it on um, a pole, a tree. You can even attach it to the side of a barn if that's something that you have in your yard. Um, and again, it has to be 10 to 15 feet up. So the thing that you would want to put in there is maybe a couple of inches of some coarse wood chips. Um, and that's about all you need to do. So that's, um, that's a Kestrel box. You want to keep an eye on it to make sure that the right creature is getting in it. Um, you may have an issue with squirrels because squirrels will like this cavity as well. And so putting a, um, a baffle of some sort on your pole to prevent the squirrels from climbing up it was, uh, is also a good idea. Any questions about a Kestrel box? You can just put them in the chat and we'll keep an eye on it. Um, the one thing you do wanna be aware of though is once you have your box up, you wanna keep an eye on it and start you know, looking for activity. And once you, if you do see activity, um, observe from a distance until you see the male bringing food to the box, okay? Once you see the male bringing food, that means the female is on um, her nest. You wanna wait about another week and then um, maybe 10 days while the female is in the process of laying her eggs. And then you can start actually checking the box physically. Um, again, since it's gonna be high up on a pole, you'll need a ladder. You need to be really careful um, when you do that because um, Kestrels have talons and sharp beaks. So you may um, want to visit only about once every two weeks to take a look at what's going on. Um, I would recommend rather than opening the box, you get one of the um, small lit um, cameras on a, on, a, on a device that you can just use to put in the hole and take a look and not have to open the box yourself. That's kind of a better way to do it than um, trying to open the box and look because the female will probably not be happy with you if you do that. This is what the babies look like um, and the net, what the nest looks like. A little baby kestrels. All right, our next one is Carolina chickadee. Um, interestingly, um, Carolina chickadees um, are more common here now than the black cap chickadees. Um, they, I'll, I'll show you the range in a little bit. The, the ranges of the two overlap right here in Pennsylvania. Um, so we get, we do get both, although the Carolina chickadees are more common now. So these uh, birds are really insect eaters, especially when they're nesting. Um, they need lots and lots of spiders and caterpillars. And that makes about 80 to 90% of their diet in the spring. In the winter, um, they will of course switch to um, more vegetable matter. They are they will have seeds and so forth, but they prefer bugs, true bugs, bees, ants, wasps, aphids, tree hoppers. They even eat stink bugs. So that's uh, it's very happy for us when they do that. The, some of the seeds that they like to eat are poison ivy, yay, blackberries, blueberries, um, seeds from pine cones. So they really have a quite omnivorous diet um, when necessary. But we like, I like them best for their, for their bug eating properties because that gets less bugs for us. They do um, build their own cavity, which is interesting. They use existing cavities, but chickadees can actually excavate their own cavities as well. So they prefer to be on the edge of a forest um, and they generally cover a territory of say, three to six acres 
Although sometimes pairs will nest within, you know, even as close as 30 feet to each other. So they're not terribly territorial. Here's a picture of a chickadee approaching its nest. This is not the kind of a nest box that I would recommend with that perch outside. Um, birds don't need a perch outside of that nesting hole. And all it really does is make it easier for a predator to, to grab on and try and reach into the, the nest box. So um, I put this out as a, as a cautionary item to not use a perch. Birds don't need that, they can fly right in. So here's the Carolina chickadee range. You can see that it extends north to just north of us. And then here's the black cap chickadee range and you can see that it extends to just south of us. So we have both um, here. And in fact, they, the two species will hybridize as well. So um, it gets very confusing here in terms of identifying chickadees. Uh, most of us that um, are using eBird um, kind of generally go with Carolina um, or even just default to chickadee species if it can't be identified. I mean, there is a way to tell the difference. The black cap chickadee does is a little bit bigger and it does have a, a slightly different um, wing bar marking, um, commonly known as the hockey stick. Um, but it's not, you know, given the lighting, it's not always that easy to tell the difference. So chickadees. So this is a typical chickadee box. Um, entrance hole about an inch and an eighth. Um, this particular box is a fairly good sized one. Again, you want to have a, an opening that you can be able to um, clean the box out when necessary. So with these you want to put um, near some native shrubs and trees that can um, attract the insects that they need to feed their young. Um, certainly avoid using any pesticides, particularly during the, the nesting season. These should be placed um, roughly eight to 10 feet high. Um, you can put them on the side of a tree. You can also put it on a um, pole. Um, the other thing that you can have, have of course, is leave your uh, dead snags up so they can excavate their own cavities if necessary, but they will very readily take nest boxes. They, um, the nests that they make will be grasses and moss and even some spider silk and some feathers. So they're re readily identifiable. Again, as with all nesting boxes, um, once you have them up, you need to keep an eye on them. One of the species that we don't want to have taking these boxes are um, house sparrows. Those are not a non-native species. Um, they're quite aggressive. And they will, in fact, try to take over a box from another species. So if you see house sparrows in the neighborhood, you want to discourage them from taking your box. And this is what their babies look like. So you can see the nest. It's got some nice moss around it. It's got some fluffy stuff. Looks like um, somebody put out some of their dog's hair for them to use, which they will take. Um, so you can put out nesting materials for the birds as well. Um, a mesh bag with um, some shredded yarn. If you uh, brush your dog, you can put some of your dog's hair out um, and that those the birds will readily take those materials to use in their nests. But when you when you put up a, a chickadee box, um, you should not put anything in the bottom as opposed to the kestrel box where you put chips, um, leave the, the cavity empty for the chickadee and let them bring their own materials in. All right. This owl, owl um, is becoming less and less common in Bucks County. Um, but they are the subject of a, um, a nest box expansion program with um, the Game Commission. So I have them up here because they're tremendously useful creatures in terms of um, vermin control. Um, so they need some open areas to hunt in. They like um, mice, rats, voles, moles. Um, they can use an area of, of up to about 500 acres. They um, will fly at night looking for these creatures. They, their nesting areas um, are typically somewhat sheltered areas. They do use some cavities, tree cavities, but more commonly um, an opening in a building is where they'll want to go in. So you can have um, a box near a, a, an opening in a, in a building that they will happily use for their nest. They don't um, build nests of sticks and grasses like a lot of other animals do, but they kind of make a, a, a small mound of um, kind of gritty material. 
Here's a, just a nice picture of one in flight. I love this picture. Okay, so this is their range. You can see we're just barely in the um, year round range. That's the purple. Um, so they would they are breeders here. And here's a typical sort of box. So it's pretty big. It's two feet um, long, 14 inches wide, um, 14 inches high, and a fairly good sized um, entrance hall for the birds. So this is the kind of thing that you can put near a barn, um, attached to a barn, attached to a silo, uh, and they will, unfortunately, they're not very common, so the odds of you actually attracting one are not that great, um, but it's always worth a try. It's good to have this near a ledge so that when the young get a little larger and they need a place to branch out, they have a place to stand. Um, and again, if you can leave your, your barn or whatever other building you have near this, or where you put this open so they have access to it, that's, um, that's ideal. And these are the babies. They are um, kind of funny looking, but this is what they look like. Um, they're, they're just little fluffy owlets. There they are a little bit bigger. You can see that there's no particular structure to that nest. It's just kind of a mound of material um, with perhaps a depression, maybe a shallow bowl shape to it, but that's that's all they need to have their nest. Okay, our next possible creature for a nesting box is the barred owl. Um, they are also cavity nesters. They are they're not one of our more common owls here in Bucks County, um, but they are found in just about all forested areas um, across the eastern United States. They like it where it's a little bit damper or even to the point of being swampy because they like to hunt for reptiles and amphibians. Um, so if you can maintain your forest and woodlands um, in, that, in those damper areas for them to forage in, that, that's terrific. So they use very large um, tree cavities. They um, prefer a well-developed understory, which given the deer population we have in Bucks County is kind of difficult to maintain. We don't have a lot of understory because the deer eat it all. Um, but they're, the trees that they nest in are, have to be fairly large, usually 20 feet tall with a diameter at least a foot and a half. Um, occasionally, they will also nest in um, abandoned platform nests from hawks and crows, but that's um, much less common than being in a cavity. Here's a picture of a barred owl in flight on his hunting trip. Just a nice picture of a roosting barred owl. Again, they are, they are nocturnal, so you'll see them in this semi-sleeping posture during the day, should you be lucky enough to see one. Here is their breeding range. So you can see that it covers the entire US, um, takes a swath across Canada up into the Pacific Northwest. And this is what their box would look like. Um, I apologize that it's a little bit fuzzy, um, but you can see that it's a fairly good sized box and uh, a fairly large hole with a slightly different shape than we normally see. It's not um, a round hole like you would typically see, but more of a, uh, a half circle type of hole. Here are some outlets. All right, probably our most common bird that takes advantage of nesting boxes and the bird that people most often want to see um, are our Eastern bluebirds. They're just gorgeous. This is actually a nest box on the uh, Bucks Audubon property. This particular nest box is in the corner of the um, community garden and it has been used, I think, every year for the past three. So they are very easily um, attracted to nest boxes. For the, for the longest time, um, bluebirds were on the decline because as people were taking down dead trees, um, turning forests into housing developments, all of the opportunities for um, naturally occurring cavities kind of went away. So without cavities, bluebirds can't nest. So people started putting up nest boxes and the population has rebounded really very, very nicely. These are um, insect eaters. They're caterpillars, um, grubs, mealworms. Um, and they are what was, we consider secondary cavity nesters because they cannot make their own cavity. So 
They use abandoned woodpecker holes, um, other natural cavities from you know trees um, having an injury, but um, they're very, very happy to take a nest box that we can provide for them. There's some nice pictures of um, bluebirds in flight. And here is their range. So um, they are year round occupants here. Um, some bluebirds do migrate and some stay around. Um, if they do stay, a lot of times they will use the nest box as a roosting box to stay warm in the winter. And as many as three, four, five um, birds will climb into one box and that kind of close proximity helps them keep each other warm. So it's good to have your boxes um, clean and ready for winter occupancy as well. So here is a picture of a bluebird box construction plan. You can make a really nice box out of a single board. So it's, um, it's not a difficult box to construct. And when you have this box, once you have this box constructed, you want to put it um, not that high. Um, anywhere between three and six feet up is sufficient for, for a bluebird. You want to have it near some native plants so that will attract the insects that the bluebird needs to eat. Um, this box should have an inch and a half entrance hole as opposed to some of the other boxes that we saw which are similar size and shape but have smaller entrance holes. Um, you want to monitor these carefully um, because you don't, again, you don't want house sparrows to take them over. Um, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about our nest watch program for bluebirds, but I can tell you that I did have um, a couple of bluebird nests um, in our boxes get taken over by house wrens, which there's um, nothing I can do about that because they're a native bird and they um, are just as welcome to use our nest boxes. Unfortunately, um, at least one pair took over a nest that had two eggs laid in it by bluebirds. Um, so those eggs, of course, did not survive. Um, but the house wrens had their babies in there instead. Um, so a bluebird um, nest watch is, uh, is important to make sure that a non-native species doesn't take that box. I would also suggest on this one um, that if you're going to put them up on a pole, it's, it's, it's not necessary, but it is welcome to put predator guards on the poles as well, because there are creatures that will climb up the pole and um, steal the eggs, raccoons, snakes. Um, they're um, quite happy to come and take eggs out of the nest. So this is what um, some baby bluebirds look like in their nest. Uh, they, bluebirds lay between five to seven eggs. Um, so you can get quite a nice crop of, of birds. They also will rebrood if they um, start their nest early enough in the spring and there's time after their first set. Um, they will lay egg, they will make a new nest and relay eggs. So if you're monitoring a bluebird box and once your baby birds have fledged, if you clean out that box, um, they're likely to come back and make another nest. They have a fair amount of um, site fidelity. If they've been successful, they will come back and use that same location. So. And once the once the babies have fledged, it's good to clean it out. And then if there's enough time left in the season, you may get a second brood, which is thrilling to me. All right, screech owls. Screech owls are um, quite common here in Bucks County. They um, eat, again, small rodents. Um, they also eat insects. They are also well adapted to a suburban and urban environments. Um, they're not in the least bit concerned about humans in their environment. Um, they're, they're not at the least bit shy of us. They are um, cavity nesters and are very happy to take a box. They um, pr are primarily nocturnal, although they are somewhat crepuscular as well, which means uh, you know, at, the, at the dawn and dusk times, you may very well see them flying. They prefer forested or wooded habitat. Um, their cavities are generally between 12 to 20 feet high or so. Um, they can go higher, um, but usually they prefer the, the 
like I said, 12 to, to 20 or so feet up. Um, they're not particularly territorial. So if there are enough suitable nesting sites, um, they, can, they will nest as close as um, 100 feet um, next to each other, particularly in areas like ours that are a little bit more suburban. If it's more rural, you know, you may want, they may be a football field apart. So you can put up a number of these boxes, um, you know, as long as they're at least 100 feet apart and you may very well get more than one pair. Here's a screech owl on the attack. And this is their um, range. You can see, again, they are year round residents here. Um, so there's not a concern about migration um, with them. So this is a typical nesting box for screech owl. Um, like most of the nesting boxes that we talk about, you want um, drainage holes in the bottom. You want a little bit of airspace at the top for um, ventilation. You want the um, inside of the box to not be too smooth. You want it to be a little bit on the rough side so that um, when the birds are trying to climb out, they have something for their talons to grip on and they can climb up readily. So um, if your wood is too smooth, you can do something um, like make a series of curves. Um, say, you know, an eighth to a quarter of an inch apart. So it gives them a little bit of a ladder to climb up um, the front wall to get to the, to the hole. Again, uh, you could put a predator guard on these, um, which, is, which is useful to keep out the folks, the, the predators that are interested in, in having lunch or dinner on your baby owls or even, even the eggs thereof. These should be mounted 10 to 20 feet high. Um, again, you want them near the woods. So this type of box um, is just about the same dimensions and construction as a kestrel box would be. A kestrel box you would put out um, more in an open field to attract a kestrel, whereas a wood a owl, screech owl box you would put um, in, the, in the woods or in at least on the edge of the woods. So that is more like their particular um, hunting territory. You want them to be facing south, southwest, um, even southeast, so that the, the warm sun can um, keep the nest warm. You don't want them facing north, northwest where the prevailing weather comes from because that'll just drive rain and snow into the box, which is not gonna be useful for, for the baby owls. If you have one of these up, um, you may, and it, it's facing south or southwest, you may very well see um, an owl just sitting with its face in the sun um, in the box as it's getting ready to go out for its hunting in the evening. They like to sit um, in the afternoon sun before they take off for their, for their nighttime hunt. Here's a baby. Um, baby owls are funny looking. Um, so this is kind of what they look like. They only lay a few eggs, not as many as the barn owl does, um, more in the, in the three to five range. This is a, a fairly um, unusual bird to, to have here. Um, they're not uncommon, um, but they are a, as well cavity nesters. This is the great crested flycatcher. Um, it's a hunting on the wing um, type of bird. Loves to catch um, all sorts of flying creatures. It will also um, take moths, beetles, grasshoppers. Um, generally speaking, um, it will also eat some sm a small amount of wild fruit. Um, they have a territory of roughly three to six acres or so. And they prefer their nests to be um, open forest or woodlands, including yards, suburban yards and parks. Um, they use, um, they are secondary cavity dwellers as well. They use um, previously occupied woodpecker holes, um, 10 or so feet up is their preferred height. Here's one in flight. Here is their range. So they are um, breeding range here, um, but they do migrate south. And so they're only here in the spring, summer, and fall. This is a fairly typical flycatcher box. It's got a bigger hole than a woodpecker or a chickadee box. You can see it's an inch and three quarters. The whole box is bigger roughly six by six on the floor um, and roughly seven inches from the hole to the floor, nine inch sides. Not a difficult box to construct, um, just like all of them are, are fairly simple to, to construct, but um, 
these are terrific um, insect eaters. Uh, I'm all for supporting the birds that are insect eaters as we lose um, some of our bats and so forth um, to white nose syndrome. I would like to encourage the insect eating birds to kind of keep the mosquito population um, down a little bit. All right. One thing about this particular box, with this size hole, it is not uncommon for a starling to try um, and gain entrance to it. So again, starlings are not um, native birds. So you wanna try and exclude them if you can. Um, so you wanna keep an eye out for that. And if they do start building a nest in, in the box, you need to remove um, a starling nest. So, um, what you can do to further discourage starling is you can mount this box um, hanging from a branch. So it sways a little bit. Um, starlings don't like that, uh, but flycatchers don't seem to mind it. So that would also discourage um, starlings from using this nest box. Here are some babies looking for food. All right, and the final thing I want to talk about for now is um, the Nest Watch program. We um, joined Cornell's Nest Watch program last year as we began to monitor our, our 47 nesting nest boxes that we have on the property. Um, it's not a difficult thing to do, but it does require a certain amount of persistence um, and perseverance to make sure that you, you keep up with the activities. Um, we will be having Nest Watch training um, in March, um, which you can attend whether you want to participate in our particular nest watch or you want to do it on your own. Um, but basically what we do with the, with the nest watch program is we keep an eye on all of our nests, make sure the proper species are nesting, um, keep an eye on the health of the nest, the health of the participants that are building the nests, um, take pictures. Um, I took quite a number of pictures. Um, so. It's a, it's a fun thing to do. We, we need to visit our nests you know, twice a week or so um, to make sure that the things are progressing the way we want. And um, with 47 nest boxes, it's nice to have um, other participants to keep an eye on all the nests. Last year, um, we had about five nests apiece, which is a fair bit to keep track of. Um, so you know, the more the merrier in terms of um, participating in nest watch. One of the things that um, we do as part of that is there is a um, there is a quiz there is a, a you know an online quiz you need to take to make sure that you understand the proper way to approach a nest, the proper way to um, approach a, a bird that's sitting on a nest, um, the right way to, to record your data and so forth. This is a community science project sponsored by um, Cornell, so we do need to keep our data in line according to the protocol so that it's useful for the scientists that are gonna use that data to keep track of how the birds are doing. All right, um, let's see. Lastly, um, here are some nest box resources. For those of you that are interested in, in building your own boxes, um, Woodworker Magazine has, has a number of excellent um, plans. 70birds.com again has a number of interesting um, and useful plans. There's the Nest Watch site and then the, um, the Audubon site um, will give you a little bit more information on you know, birds that need help or that you'll be able to help. All right. And that's my slides. Questions, comments, info that you need. That was really great, Diane. Um, now, when do you recommend um, making sure that the nest boxes are up by? So if we want, if they want to be the most successful, when should they make sure that they're absolutely up and in place? Absolutely up and in place the first week of March. Birds are, are going to start coming back um, right around then, and they will be looking for places to nest. So if you can get them up a little bit before that, that's even better, but the first week of March um, and if you have existing nest boxes, they should also be cleaned out by the first week of March. That should do it. Should be fine. Excellent. And just one more time, 
what are the sort of three or four things that no matter what kind of size nest box, you should always make sure that the nest box sort of has? Okay, so the nest box should always um, have a rough interior so that the bird is able to, the baby birds are able to exit the nest box. They should always have some sort of drainage in the floor, whether it's um, cut corners or holes drilled. Uh, they should, it should always also have um, some spacing between the sides and the roof for ventilation. So those are the most important things. And then of course you get the predator guards and so forth you know, that are, are useful. Um, but those are the three most important things to make sure that your baby birds can survive. Without the ventilation, it can get really, really hot in some of those nest boxes. Um, so it's gonna be too hot for the birds if you're not careful and make sure you have so, the ventilation right. So Diane, the, this is Alan, the direction pointing, um, you, you said toward the, toward the side. I've, I've read different, different opinions. Sometimes they tell you not toward the sun, you know, toward the south, southeast, because it gets too hot. And then I've yeah. read. My personal opinion and the things that I've seen be most successful, at least in, in our experiences here, is facing south is absolutely fine. Um, the nest boxes that I was had most success with um, last year with Nest Watch were all faced south. Mm. Um, the one thing I would say you definitely don't want to do is have it face north or northwest. Because cool. that is the direction that the weather comes from and that will definitely be too cold. So again, I think as long as you have sufficient ventilation in the box, having it face south or southwest is not terrible. Um, south or southeast would probably be a little bit cooler than southwest. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions? Very good. Um, if you are interested in taking part in our in our Bluebird Nest Watch program, um, definitely keep an eye out um, for emails from us um, or on our website. Um, the training program will be, I believe, sometime in mid to late March is when we're looking at. Um, yep. So definitely um, keep a lookout for information on that. Um, we're also hoping to partner with, um, with the Doylestown EAC um, because they have a bunch of bluebird nest boxes that they would like volunteers to monitor as well. So, so if you're a little too far for us, you know, and closer to, to them, then, um, then perhaps we can, we can hook you up with them as well. Um, it's a great project. Um, all the volunteers who did last year just really loved it and enjoyed it, so. It's really um, great. It gets, it gets you outside at least a couple of times a week, um, taking a walk around. Um, and there, I tell you, there's nothing quite so thrilling as your nest having eggs in it. <laughs> it's like, I felt like a grandmother. It was so exciting. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, this video will be, um, it has been recorded and it'll be up on YouTube as well as Facebook if anyone wants to, to rewatch it. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us today and hopefully we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.